Hey everyone, I know we're just getting, uh, getting everyone logged on here, so we're gonna give it about 30 seconds before we start. We like to start right on time here at Grace Hill, so just give a few minutes. I know there's a slight delay between the time when we turn on this webinar and uh, the time that uh, you all can get in. Just a few more seconds. We'll get you in and out of here in an hour, we promise. A few more seconds until we start. Okay, y'all, I gave you a minute. So we're gonna start this webinar today. Welcome and thank you for attending today's webinar, ESG, GREVS and Reporting, What's New for 2023? My name is Amy Fisher and I'm a commercial sales executive at Grace Hill. Now, Grace Hill might sound unfamiliar to some of you, so I'll give you a quick background. In 2020, of course, just as the pandemic was starting, Grace Hill acquired Kingsley Surveys, and I'm sure that's a name most of you in commercial real estate know. Grace Hill is our company, and Kingsley Surveys is just one of our vast products that we offer for the real estate industry. In the next hour, we're gonna take a look at how ESG and GREZ reporting priorities can impact your bottom line. Our agenda, market context for ESG, a little alphabet soup about that, benefits of GREZ participation, components of an effective ESG strategy, engagement pathways, and then we'll finalize everything with question and discussion. Now, before we get started, I want to give you a few housekeeping items about Zoom. Today's webinar is being recorded and it will be shared with all registered attendees later this week. As an attendee, you're currently in listen only mode. This helps with the outside distractions and noise. If you do have questions, we would love you to use the Q&A box located on your screen, also noted as the chat box. I'd like to encourage all attendees to engage in conversation using that chat box. It's a great way to connect and share ideas and maybe shout out what part of the country or, or even world that you're joining us from. Um, if you have any technical issues or need assistance, please message virtual classroom and my colleague Stephanie Anderson will be happy to help you. Okay, so we're gonna kick off today by introducing our speaker, Brianna Walraven. Brianna is an internationally recognized leader in the real estate industry and an accomplished author, a sought after speaker and a talented instructor for more than 25 years. She founded Corporate Sustainability Strategies, also known as CSS, to help clients develop and execute strategies in the area of real estate operations, resiliency, ESG and carbon neutrality. Ms. Walraven's a BOMA fellow holds a BA in economics and an MBA with an emphasis in finance and real estate from the University of Southern California. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Brianna. Thanks so much, Amy. And uh, before we get going, I just really wanna thank uh, you, Stephanie and everyone at, at Grace Hill for the opportunity to be here with you today and, and with the group. As Amy, as you just touched on, our goal is to make sure we're giving you valuable information. So do think about questions as they come up, fire them off, and we're going to try to answer this as we move through our discussion today. Again, great to be with all of you. So first, I want to start providing some market context, which really, I think, level set starts with, you know, when we say sustainability, what do we mean today? What does that look like today? And you've probably heard a lot of acronyms, one of which is ESG, or Environmental, Social, and Governance. And you may be saying, well, what does that really mean? And I just thought it would be helpful for the group just to reinforce what we're talking about. Um, and then secondly, as we talk about definition, I also wanna connect it to the business cases. What are these topics potentially impacting financial performance? So environmental is one most people know. Um, we think about getting more energy efficient and water efficient and reducing waste. Um, and if we connect that to the potential financial uh, performance, hey, that can save us on our operating uh, expenses. So get those connections. But it's also things like environmental reporting and disclosure, which we're gonna touch on today. It's also about managing uh, climate-related risk, 
Um, and all of those have potential uh, goals of reducing, you know, fines or lawsuits or those types of things. So when we talk about environmental, it's a little broader than just energy efficiency, for example. Corporate governance is one most people are, are getting more comfortable and understand. You know, it's not just about having policy, but it's also about the process to enforce those policies. Um, and so when we talk about things like executive compensation, that's really about, to tie it to the financial performance, that's really about the alignment of interests. We want our um, leadership and companies to, and real estate owners and operators to align with shareholders and other stakeholders' interests in those properties. The one we get the most topic uh, or most questions on as a topic is social. Um, so if we talk about product integrity, what we're really talking about is product quality. What's the building quality? Is it energy efficient? Is it water efficient? But it's also, is it safe? Is it healthy? Which during COVID came up more and more. Another one that we would talk, talk, on, talk about in this context, which has come up more in the last several years, is diversity and inclusion. And you may say, well, what does that have to do with financial impact? There's been study after study that has shown that clients that have, or excuse me, customers and real estate portfolios that have high diversity um, and inclusion programs have improved productivity, morale, but they also have less blind shots, so they make better decisions, all of which reduces risk and ties directly to financial performance. So again, just wanted a level set of when we talk about sustainability or ESG, this is increasingly what it means today in the environment. Next, I thought it would just be, again, important to do some level setting on what are some of the mega trends. You see two big blue boxes here. One says physical, one says tra transition. These are directly tied to uh, the physical and transitional risks associated with climate change. Um, and without going through all the weeds of this slide, what we're really talking about is this is coming up more than just in the physical content, which is we, we've always had you know, storms, we've always had um, you know, extreme cold, but it's worse storms, it's worse tornadoes. It's, it's not a snowstorm, it's a polar vortex, right? This is what the, the impacts of climate change and that has direct implications for how we run real estate, all of which leads to, as the market continues to transition around these kinds of risks is more pressure from investor, more legislative and regulatory change, more tenant demand, and where technology and prop tech or property technology um, is going to be more important in the work that we do. I think it's also important to really tie this back to investors because they are increasingly not just asking, hey, do you know what sustainability is and what are you doing on uh, ESG, but they're requiring greater transparency and performance. And by requiring, I mean, if you're privately held, they're going to ask for it contractually uh, if you're publicly held, they're going to say, we're either going to invest uh, in your stock or stay invested in your stock, or we're not. So it's coming up more and more, and we hear this from clients every day. We're also seeing a lot more ESG-related legislative and regulatory requirements, which I'll talk about here in the next slide. Um, and there's this alphabet soup of frameworks that are really focused on transparency and then benchmarking, and we'll talk a little bit about that. The last point here in terms of market context and why growing investor interest is that demographics are shifting. If you're under the age of 40 today, you generally care about these topics. In fact, Morgan Stanley has had a commercial where they say one in four investors today is seeking to put their 401k investments in some type of sustainable vehicle, all of which to say is there's increasing demand for investments that can fit in an ESG box. And we know that for commercial real estate, demographics drives our business. We want to be in the path of, you know, growth, growth in population, growth in jobs. And so understanding ESG is increasingly why investors are focusing on this for their portfolios. As we talk about um, kind of the transparency requirements and ESG requirements, I know there's a lot going on in this slide, but I'm going to try to move through it uh, quickly and pretty simply. If we focused on the upper right corner, you're seeing a graph um, in blue and yellow or blue and orange bar charts that reflect the number of policy interventions tied to ESG topics. And it, to be clear, the blue are voluntary, like you can do if you want, and the orange are the mandatory. And what you've seen in the last 20 years is a dramatic rise in these public policy interventions 
requiring more ESG activities to happen. And let me give you a couple of examples of these. In the upper left-hand corner, you're gonna see a map of the United States. This is a map of where we have energy benchmarking and transmer transparency and beyond requirements. As you can see here, there are three states and there are now over 40 cities that have some type of benchmark and disclosure requirement. And then if you don't meet certain thresholds, this beyond um, uh, metric is really around, hey, do you have, if you're not getting a 75 or above on Energy Star, you have to do efficiency measures and retrofits and do technical audits. So that is on the rise. There was a little pumping of the brakes during COVID, but we expect this to continue to arise, um, continue to grow and rise. In the bottom right is the national building performance standards. Uh, building performance standards are really focusing on making sure buildings are actually performing where the, the former was about transparency, tell us how you're performing. This is if you don't perform, there could be a penalty or a fine. And what you'll see is um, there are three states on the roadmap to have these requirements and another 35 plus jurisdictions that also are putting these in place by next year. So really important to understand, it's not just about being transparent, but also about performance. Last two topics for the Securities and Exchange Commission or SEC, Last March, they put out new rules that will require publicly held companies to disclose on their um, climate related risks, as well as disclose on the greenhouse gas emissions for all scopes, scope one, scope two, scope three. Um, in and of itself, you may think, hey, that's no big deal. Uh, what does this mean to me? Well, what that means is there's gonna be more focus on climate risk and also on disclosure, because how do I get to emissions? That means I've got to track more data. Um, the other thing to note on this is the SEC, when they make a rule change, usually gets a few hundred comments talking to a, a, a lawyer friend of mine, Brad Malatsky, a little shout out at Dwayne Morris. Um, and they got over 10,000 comments to this, but it's very clear that we expect that ruling to come down in 2023. So that is uh, potentially new news. And secondly, that they've given a signal that they would also not just apply this to publicly held companies, but that they would apply it to registered investment advisors and privately held funds. So that means kind of everybody could be affected here. Last comment on this slide is SFDR or the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation. This is coming out of the European Union. And you may be saying, Brenna, don't you know where you're at? This is the US, we don't have a, we're not in the European Union. The, the issue is that if you get any capital out of European Union, meaning if you're privately held, you have European investors, or if you're publicly held, you have European investors holding your stock, they are increasingly required to comply with disclosure, which means it's going to have implications likely for you to help them comply. Real quickly, the three articles of how you get thrown into uh, classification are Article 6, which means I don't have ESG in my real estate portfolio at all. I don't care about it. It's not important. Otherwise known as uninvestable. The second um, is Article 8, which is you're integrating environmental and or social characteristics into the investment thesis. And Article 9 uh, is more like uh, where everything in the fund aligns with a, again, sustainable or social uh, target. Think of it as like an impact fund that might invest in all affordable housing would be an example. The problem is nobody wants to be uninvestable, i.e. they don't want to be Article 6. Nobody wants, or it's really hard to meet the Article 9. So a lot fall into this Article 8. What does that mean? You're probably going to hear about this stuff more and more. Let's talk about the alphabet soup. Um, I've already talked about the SEC. We're going to talk a little bit more about GRES. I just wanted to touch on a couple of other, other, other of these. SASB, the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board, has now merged with an international body to make this truly a global uh, standard for 77 industries, including real estate. Uh, GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative, is a very prescriptive, detailed reporting disclosure requirement, and that is coming up more and more for clients needing to disclose. In the middle, you're talking about climate-related issues on TCFD or the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, which is really about making your financial disclosures more transparent around the risks and opportunities associated with climate change. And then science-based targets and CDP, or formerly known as uh, the Carbon Disclosure Project, are really around science-based targets for decarbonizing. A uh, lot of acronyms going on there, but just suffice to say, if you haven't heard about some of these topics, it's likely coming soon.
I thought it would be helpful to, to touch on um, what's happening with some major organizations uh, and what are they doing around ESG. Uh, I'll just touch on a couple. Uh, MetLife, um, they, you think of them as an insurance company, but they also have a subsidiary that invests fully in real estate. Um, and they launched during COVID, no less, their Met Zero program, which is where they are going to take several funds to net zero and have made a not only a commitment, but are aggressively working towards that goal. Heitman has partnered with ULI and other organizations to do quite a bit of analysis on climate risk and how that has implication for asset value, stranded assets that are unsellable, et cetera. Um, if you looked at Kilroy and Hudson, both not only have made commitments to net zero, but they actually have already achieved neutrality and are still continuing to be a leader and a force in this space. ULI, in fact, which represents Urban Land Institute, actually represents major real estate organizations across the globe, has a commitment um, for their Greenprint Center uh, members to have a decarbonization goal by 2030. And they've had broad uptake in this. Last point, it's not just real estate company, but likely your tenants are going to be asking about these topics. So Amazon, GM, Microsoft, Walmart, all have very credible um, commitments to be uh, addressing climate change and carbon neutrality in the 2030 to 2040 timeframe. All of which to say, it's gonna come up again more and more, not just ESG, but even more specific around decarbonization. It's important, I've talked about um, how some of the uh, ES and G topics can support financial performance or create value, which we know is a core uh, value proposition for real estate owners and operators. Um, we know, for example, if we get more efficient, reduce waste, that should save us on operating expenses. Um, but it also ties to things like increased uh, resident retention um, and tenant engagement and retention as well shorter lease up and downtime. And we're seeing that quite a bit, all of which translates into higher NOIs and creating value. But I wanted on this slide really just to touch on the downside or the negative risk reduction benefits of an ESG program. One is we know, as I touched on on our slide of all the regulatory and public policy intervention, we reduce our compliance risk by just saying, hey, we know this stuff is important and we're gonna track and measure and monitor our performance. Then when a regulatory requirement like an energy benchmark and disclosure requirement comes up, hey, we're ready and we're not going to have a fine. These also tie to things like insurance premium risk uh, reduction. And this is particularly important. We're seeing insurance premiums explode in certain parts of the country. So anything we can do to mitigate those risks and costs can have a real value. Um, lastly, I would just talk about reputational risk. So if you think about Norfolk Southern um, and the disaster that's happening in Ohio and our, our thoughts uh, go out to that community and, and state is huge reputational impacts for having a disaster. These are things we want to avoid and this having an ESG program helps you do that. I, I had BlackRock on the other slide but I really did wanna take an additional second to touch on what Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock said is that ESG issues ranging from climate change to diversity to board effectiveness have real and quantifiable financial impacts. And you may be saying, well, why do I care what Larry Frank of BlackRock has to say? Well, not only do they own $60 billion in real estate assets, but they actually have almost nine T's and Tom trillion dollars of investment capital on behalf of their clients. So they have a real ripple effect on the economy. When BlackRock says this is important and we wanna see you're uninvestable if you're not aligning with say, using a TCFD or using some of these frameworks, suddenly it has a big impact throughout the investment community. And I know a lot of you are focused on, on this and some of you are just trying to figure out GRESB. So this is something we really want to spend a couple minutes on. Um, so what is GRESB? It was formerly known as the Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmark. It is officially known as GRESB today, not GRESB, not the Global Real Estate Sustainability, GRESB. That's what it's known. So, you know, be with the cool kids and know how to name the company. It'll probably save you some time and, and pain. There are almost 2,000 property companies, REITs, and funds that have participated in GRES in 2022, representing almost $7 trillion of investment capital. So really having a huge impact um, on the industry. Um, it's the only reporting framework that's specific to real estate. 
Um, and I think it's important to understand that it's measured against three ESG components. What you see here in the red circles is there's a management component that's really around process and policy and do you have leadership positions on ESG topics. Um, and then the performance aspect, which is really around um, do you have energy, water, waste data, but the performance co component also includes things like tenant engagement and how are you doing that tenant or resident engagement. Those two components combine to give you a GRES standing investment score. That's the score you're probably used to hearing about. It's a score between one and 100. Um, and then if we look at the development side, so you say, hey, I'm a developer. Um, I don't really have energy, water, waste data. I don't have tenant yet or in that, then you're likely uh, gonna be asked about the development benchmark, which uses those same question on management, on policy and process, et cetera. But then it has uh, a series of questions all around certifications, uh, policies on your development for energy, water, waste, community engagement, et cetera. Those combine to give you that development benchmark. And you may be saying like, why do I care about GRASP? Um, it's you know fundamentally gonna come up more and more. I actually had two more slides, so I'm gonna backtrack here a second. It's important to understand the process. So GRASP is a relative benchmark uh, of real estate portfolios. So, and they do also for infrastructure portfolios. What does that mean? Is your benchmark against your peers? The peers are set by GRES, not by you. So if you're an industrial distribution warehouse portfolio based in the US and you're privately held, that's who you're gonna be compared against. You're not gonna have a multifamily portfolio compared against an office portfolio, for example. You're not gonna have a publicly held portfolio compared against a privately held portfolio. So that's how it's a, a relative benchmark because your scoring isn't, if I do these three things, I'm gonna get X points. It's how you do things relative to your peers doing those same types of things. I think hey, it's also- Brenna? Yeah, oh, please. Sorry, sorry, that just kind of- Oh, um, please. I get a, a question a lot from clients when I'm doing Kingsley webinars, um, asking to understand the GRES performance benchmarking versus scoring. So like if they do a Kingsley survey, how, how, how do you translate that? Is it, it will increase your score? It increases your benchmark comparison? I know there's both employee and tenant in GRES, so I didn't know how should yeah, we be relaying great, that to, to those questions? Great question. It absolutely does both. Um, a tenant or resident survey and an employee survey both contribute to your GRES scoring. Let's stay on tenant because it's the most uh, typical that you're probably going to get asked about. Um, GRES is going to ask, not did you do a survey, but was it done internally or externally? Also, if you did a survey, how many people responded? Um, and then lastly, what kind of questions did you ask? Did you ask about uh, overall satisfaction? Did you ask a net promoter score? For those of you not familiar with net promoter, it's asking, um, would you promote or recommend this property on a scale of one to 10? Those averaging an eight and above saying, yeah, I'd really recommend this property um, would be a net promoter, right? Those are questions that Grez asks about, but we can't just say we're doing a survey and that's done by a third party, you actually have to demonstrate it through a report or some documentation. So I think it's important for your clients to know, first and foremost, yes, it, it will improve your scoring. And I'll talk about that just in two seconds. But secondly, we need evidence to prove up that you've done the survey. It's been done by Kingsley in this example, and that it has those response rate and questions. As it relates specifically to scoring, there are actually two questions tied to this. The first question is worth one point is, do you do a survey? And I just kind of outline what that's at. The second question is, do you follow up on that survey? Do you actually engage and try to you know, make things better? You can't get the second point and the second question if you didn't say yes to the first, it's kind of a trick. So it's really worth two points, which may seem small, but it's a pretty cost-effective way to get those two points, one. And two, it's something that um, you can control and, and can like energy performance, sometimes we can't control that, right? How tenants use and occupy real estate, there's things we can't control to some degree. With this is something you can control. The last point that I would make, and I think it's a good question is, this is an industry best practice, which is to get feedback from your customer on how you're doing and then having a follow-up program. Did that answer your question, Amy? 
Yes, thank you very much. Excellent. So last point on that, let's, one more thing on, on what's new. This is something we did want to touch on today. A um, couple of key things. One is portfolio completeness, completeness has been a priority, particularly in the last, say, five years with GRES. What do we mean by that? Um, we want to make sure that when you submit to GRES, you're submitting on the whole portfolio. You're not cherry picking those properties that are top performers, that have a certification, right? We want to do it for the entire portfolio. How does GRES look at that? They look for evidence. So if you are publicly held, they might ask for you to provide your 10K or annual report to prove that you're reporting on the whole portfolio. You used to be able to not report on things that you own less than a 25% share on. Today, you have to report on it regardless of your ownership interest. 1%, you still have to report on it. Secondly, renewable energy. They've changed how they look at renewable energy. It used to be if you bought renewable energy through your utility, for example, you could take credit for that. No longer. It's now either on-site renewable energy at a property and you take the meter and get that data that way, or you buy renewable energy credits and can take that. So little changes there. Just want to touch on a couple of others in terms of man management leadership. There's uh, a change in uh, the ESG objectives, and it's they've added this component of not just ESG topics, but both DEI and health and well-being. And then similarly on ESG decision making, do you have a DEI person responsible, or do you have a climate in addition to a climate and ESG uh, person responsible? And then LE5, who's the most senior de decision maker on DEI? Usually that's the head of HR, but we're increasingly seeing clients have a head of diversity, for example. So Greg is going to ask more about those kinds of questions. Secondly, um, on management policies, um, there's now a component to have net zero. So do you have a net zero component of your ESG policy or environmental policy? Last is on uh, climate-related risk management. There's one question, RM6, which has four parts. Um, that has been in the survey, but it's now going to be scored. So these are some pretty important changes to be aware of. Um, lastly, there's some things, just signals that aren't going to necessarily be scored, but they're going to be on the radar, which is these commitments to net zero um, standards. So in performance targets, do you have a net zero target? Is it science-based, et cetera? And then in the development side, are you looking at embodied carbon and assessing that as part of your process? So just wanted to touch on a couple changes. Some of them may not have an implication. If you don't do net zero, it is what it is, but it's just giving you a signal that that's gonna get asked about more and more. But fundamentally, why should we care about any of this? Um, I think fundamentally, it's really that um, more and more investors do. Um, and this, this slide could be three, four, five pages long with the number of investors who are investor members of GRESP, and they use the data and performance of the submitting companies to evaluate whether they're investable and whether they're helping them achieve their own uh, requirements. And you'll notice a lot of these are not just European uh, organizations, but US based. So again, if it hasn't happened yet, be prepared. You're probably going to start getting asked about um, GRESB and can you comply? Hey, Brennan, um, that's also something that comes up quite frequently in my meetings. Um, I have a lot of folks that might be new in the industry or they might be with a smaller organization and they've never heard of GRESB. So in your opinion, do you think this is something that will continue to be important and that they really should consider looking into regardless of the size of their portfolio? Yeah, great question, Amy. I think even if um, you haven't been asked yet and you haven't thought about submitting, I would argue uh, before you worry about submitting, be prepared to answer the question. If somebody says to you, hey, uh, we think GRES was important, what do you think? Your answer should not be, what are you talking about? Right. The answer should be, hey, yes, I'm familiar. We've been investigating. We've been looking at it. Tell us more about how you think about GRESP. And the biggest thing that I can tell you is starting to track your energy water waste data is a first big step. And then second, as we're going to touch about here a little bit further more, engagement is important with your employees and with your customers, whether those are tenants or residents really critically important. Um, and it's an easy way you can show your investor clients that you are uh, committed to doing industry best practices that would support 
even their grad submittal. Um, does that answer your question, Amy? Yes, yes. I, I was definitely curious on the size because a lot of the smaller uh, portfolios just, just don't know about GRES. So. Yeah, and, and mm -hmm. again, for smaller folks, I would say, hey, maybe you don't have to do a whole submittal, but if an investor comes to you, you not only want to say, hey, I know I've been looking at it, I am familiar, I know what you're talking about, but second, you can say, hey, we'd be happy to support your efforts. Let's talk through what that looks like. And now you're helping their submittal which will take some pressure off and give you time to kind of get up to speed. Right, let's talk about kind of some core um, components of an effective strategy. Uh, again, I always want to make sure we're tying it to the business case. Um, we like to say you, we save more than we spend and we create value, um, which is really the core function as real estate owners and operators and investors is to add value, create value. Um, there's a lot of ways to add value, but we also want to do so in a way that reduces risk, which we've talked about. I think it's important to understand that increasingly the demand for transparency means you can't just say you're doing something. You actually have to demonstrate it. You have to show progress and then be able to report on that progress over time. So if we look at this um, graphic on the right, um, the way to think about it is if we get more um, competitive with our operating expenses because we're managing energy and water and waste. Um, we also, as we get more efficient and manage those areas, we can better control indoor air quality. We often can better control um, temperature and thus comfort and satisfaction for occupants. When we do that, that means we have less typically less downtime for releasing, i.e. higher renewal rates. If we had a 1% improvement in uh, retention, uh, lease retention would have not only increased revenue and higher NOI, but ultimately higher asset value. All of which is to say, what are the key components? You need to understand what the goals of the organization. Typically, it'll be things like creating value, meeting an investor expectation, having high customer satisfaction, but understanding those goals and then mapping what are the material risks and opportunities around getting to those goals, which really means having a plan. Right? We, don't, we don't get in the car and go across country without a roadmap. We need a plan and an effective ESG strategy helps you do that. And then lastly, engagement is key. Internally, it's getting the right stakeholders involved. That doesn't just mean the C-suite. It means your colleagues, your peers, everybody in the team has to understand the importance, has to understand what needs to be done and do their part to contribute. And then externally, making sure you're getting credit for the things you're doing is something that's key. And that's where these survey engagement tools can really help with that. Let's talk a little bit about engagement pathways. So how do I do some of this? Um, I just think it's important to understand. <clears throat> you'll, you'll see that there's a lot of different ways you can do this. So internally, you know, face-to-face -face is, is something that we want to reinforce as important. I know we've been um, on Zoom and, and doing a lot of things virtually. But as we've been coming back into the office and, and getting more, you know, going to conferences and seeing folks, face-to-face -face matters. Building that relationship matters. Um, but measuring that over time is also something that's important. How do I really know I'm doing better? I, if I just had a conversation, it's harder. But if I'm tracking and benchmarking, which is something I really love uh, about the Kingsley surveys, is this benchmark capability, which I know I think, Amy, you're going to touch on. But external stakeholders are also incredibly important. So that is not just tenants, it could be your investors. It could be your supply chain. Um, there's a whole host. Um, and I think you should make sure you're thinking about all those engagement channels. What you see here is some of the ways you can measure those metrics over time, right? And, and these are how you can help not only report in GRES, but also have healthy discussions with your tenants, with your investors, with your employees about you know, things that you're doing to make them more comfortable and more satisfied. I think it's important, um, this is something we wanted to reinforce this year is that again, but for Grasb in particular, but I think you know, is true in general with investors and, and other stakeholders, you can't just say, yeah, we do that. Yeah, we do that. You actually have to prove it up. For graduate, re requires a report, a document, something that shows that the surveys were completed by a third party. 
um, that it shows the response rate, that it includes key metrics for questions like overall satisfaction and net promoter. So these are things that you have to demonstrate so that they get comfortable. And we've had clients use other tools, I'll be honest, and not get full credit. So because it was unclear to uh, Grez whether it was truly a third party or was it an internal software that you use to run a survey, so this is where I think, you know, Grace Hill through their Kingsley survey uh, product line can really offer you good feedback, benchmarks, but also support your GRES reporting. With that, let me turn it back over to Amy to talk a little bit more about. Awesome, thank you. So yes, as Brenna was saying, um, we have had a long-standing partnership with GRES and you could say that our surveys are almost specifically built to get you all of those GRES Point. So obviously I can't offer a guarantee with a lot of legal mumbo jumbo in, in included, but you know, personally I can say that our surveys will cover every point that you need to do for this, for, to get those GRES points. So some of the surveys that we do offer, uh, we have both tenant and resident surveys. Now, if you're looking at the tenant, of course, we're gonna focus on what class of real estate that is. So we have medical office, industrial office, and, and, and uh, one is holding my mind. Um, anyway, we'll get back to that. And then we have the resident surveys. We have client and investor surveys, which um, a lot of people are really beefing up those and starting to do more of them. And then we have the employee engagement surveys. And then on the next slide, um, there's some, some features that you can expect to see on our surveys to get that tenant experience. So this is specific to tenant. Of course, we're gonna ask about property management. So if you do hire, say, third-party property managers, you wanna see how they're performing. Um, leasing tenant improvements, amenities, services. Very important, the net promoter score. We are the only commercial real estate survey that, that I know of that includes the net promoter score. And of course, we also have that overall satisfaction question in there for GRES as well. And then finally, if we go to the Kingsley Index that Brenna had touched on, the Kingsley Index, uh, we survey over 2.2 billion square foot of com commercial real estate annually. So what we do is we're gonna compare you, your assets to other assets that are similar. So like with what was mentioned before, you don't get compared, industrial does not get compared to medical, for example. Um, we drill down, which is very unique. So we're gonna drill down to not only what type of asset you are, but where you are located. So why, why is that important? So let's say you're in New York City and you got a rating of a three for your elevators. And then let's say you're in my hometown uh, in Ohio, a small town, and you got rated a three of an elevator. Well, a three rating in New York City might be pretty good actually on an elevator, but a three rating in my hometown would be really bad. So we wanna make sure you're comparing apples to apples and we do that down to what type property class you are, relevant data, geography, et cetera. So I don't want to spend too much time on, on Kingsley, of course, because we're here to learn about GRES and ESG. And I know we did have some questions come in. So I'm going to uh, read that question to Brenna here in a minute. And uh, anyone else that has questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or in the Q&A, whatever's easier for you. Um, so the first one's from Michael. And Michael wants to know, what's the difference between GREVS and the Energy Star Portfolio Manager, and is one better than the other? Uh, great question, uh, Michael. Um, appreciate you asking and joining today. So let's differentiate. Um, GREVS is a relative benchmark of a portfolio of real estate, and Energy Star, and including their Energy Star Portfolio Manager tool, is a benchmarking platform for energy, water, waste, and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and you can seek certification for your, for your top performing buildings in terms of energy efficiency. So the difference is Energy Star, although you can track an entire portfolio, is usually an asset by asset tracking tool um, and certification and recognition program. Um, and GRES is a portfolio level relative benchmark. The other nuance that I would say, and I really want to emphasize, Energy Star is 
fantastic. And it's something that I've used literally since very early in my uh, career. Why? One is it's free. Can we start with free? Free is always helpful when you're trying to get started on a thing like energy data tracking and things of that nature. Um, secondly, it's increasingly the industry standard uh, for energy water waste benchmarking. Um, and thirdly, for these energy benchmarking and disclosure requirements, for example, that we talked about, those require you to submit your um, disclosures using Energy Star. So there's a lot of value propositions for Energy Star. They are different. One really focuses on certainly asset by asset and portfolio benchmarking of just data. The other is a benchmark to compare yourself around ES and G topics at a portfolio level. Hopefully that answers the question. Great question though. Awesome. Michael, if that did not answer your question, please chat us additionally. So we're open for more questions. Um, in the meantime, I did want to let you know if you're enjoying this information and would like some more uh, details about ESG, that our Grace Hill team has a new asset that's coming to you next week. Uh, we're going to announce an ebook coming out. It's going to be uh, Kingsley Surveys highlighting ESG, industry pressures, and evolving best practices. The tool is going to be exactly what owners and operators need in their tool belt. And I didn't write that, our marketing team did, but they're better than me. <laughs> so, That's great, though. That's exciting. Yep. So, um, I actually had a, a one question that I had thought of that comes up when I talk to uh, prospective clients. Right. They're interested in ESG, or I'm sorry, in GRES, and submitting to GRES. And they're curious, is there an average, like, time commitment or, you know, hiring someone like you possibly would cut that time? Like, what can they expect in that whole process? How much is it going to, how heavy of a lift is it going to be for them, basically? You know, great question, Amy. And I'm so glad you brought it up because it is one that people are trying to get their arms around. Um, I will say that folks that do it on their own usually have a staff of two to five people to support the data gathering and preparation and organization process. Um, and they're usually spending roughly six months of time to prepare and then go through the submittal. Um, so let's understand some timing. So the GRES portal opens April 1 and closes July 1. So you have a very specific window to put in your energy, water, waste, your policies, write your narratives to describe what you're doing, include your ESG report, all of that stuff. Um, and to get prepared for that, you work on gathering your data, you know, finishing your ESG report, doing those things. So putting that all together, um, again, usually takes six months. Um, it can take as much as nine months. I'm not saying every minute of every day for nine months, five people are doing that, but it's a big bulk of that time for at least, again, two to five people. We do help clients uh, submit to grow to take that pressure off. And what we try to do is uh, make it as easy and painless as possible. So we help write the narratives, put together the evidence, help them understand how a question, what a question is really asking and how to answer it. Is it a yes or a no? And if it's a yes, what boxes do we check and why? How would we support um, that uh, answer? Even if you're just supporting it internally to make sure you feel it's accurate, but also upon audit, GRES does randomly audit a certain percentage of submittals. You wanna be able to support an answer. You know, we still take about six, months of time, but we're doing a lot of the heavy lifting of organizing, project managing, developing the content, following up on questions, concerns, errors, flags, and then getting all that into the uh, portal for a submittal. Um, I'll also make one other comment that there's a couple things that Grez does. It's called a response check. So in the middle of the process, we really recommend uh, firms do the response check, which is basically a pre-audit of your submittal where Grez will tell you, yeah, you check three boxes, but I only see evidence for two things, or I'm not clear on the third thing. Can you make that a little more clear? And that allows people like us and, and or our clients to refine the evidence or responses to make sure they get credit for the things that they're doing. That's an additional step and a process. It's in that same time frame. But as you're kind of getting a, a sense, it, it does take a fair amount of time. It's a great yeah. question. 
good to know. Um, we had a couple more comments and questions that came in. So um, a, a question is, will we be able to share the slides? And yes, everybody uh, on this webinar will be getting a copy of, of the slides. Um, Stephanie Anderson, I'm going to throw this to you. They want to know, should they wait for the ebook information via email, or do they go to their website? How are they going to get notified about that email, that uh, ebook that's coming out? Great question, Amy. We are happy to share that out. Next week, once it is published, we will have it live on our website. We'll also be posting it on all of our social media platforms. And we will also be sending it out via email to our clients. So definitely look for that. And of course, if all else fails, if you need it super fast next week after it's released and can't find it, your um, account rep would be super happy to connect with you and send it. So just put me on the list, you know, I, I'm very interested to see what you guys put together. Uh, that's great. Thank you. Um, I do have another question from the audience. Um, how do your clients think about ESG capital or financing strategies to support ESG initiatives? Is it important to them? Yeah, um, I think the question is around, hey, if you need to do retrofits or other projects that tie to ESG, um, are they going to use internal capital? Or are they going to finance those? Um, and I would say it, it does vary. Most of our clients tend to be middle to larger organizations and in multi, many cases, global firms. And so they're less interested in trying to finance um, retrofits or projects. But I, I do think there's a real niche, especially for you know, medium to smaller firms that may not have as much access to capital. Um, I think as long as the um, uh, approach is well thought through, um, there's a lot of opportunities. I would actually also say that the U.S. Department of Energy's Better Building Solution Center is really a great place to go look at some of these options in terms of whether financing might make sense to you as an organization. Um, I'm biased because I actually help work um, with the team at Retech Advisors with the DOE and developing a tool that allows you to ask questions about what's important to you. Like, do you need lender approval? Is that important to you? You answer that question. You go through a series of questions and then it'll tell you what types of solutions would be best for you. And that may be a good way to figure out, yes, okay, this might be a good option. And then they have partners that participated um, in that program that can get referrals. So great question. I think it's going to come up more, especially again for um, smaller to medium. The last point, uh, firms and organizations and portfolios, but I'll also say we've also seen an explosion of green bonds. Um, and that's really about going to the public markets to take to save, you know, 10 to 15 basis points on your cost of your debt capital. So just to do green stuff, certifications, retrofits, and the like. So great question. Um, we have another one that came in from Lulu. And Lulu, um, chat, chat me back if I'm not saying this right. I think she's referring to when you said you would need a staff of two to five for GRESB. I think that's what she was referring to for the submittal process. Uh, and wants to know what's the tenant headcount that would cover. And she's asking maybe around 1,500. Like is there a yeah, I'm not sure. And, and Lulu, come in again if we don't answer this uh, correctly or what you were looking for. I think when we talk about, when I was mentioning staff, this is usually the real estate organization's staff. And that's, it's typically um, if they're doing it in-house. I would say, um, and then I'm going to let Stephanie add to this here in a second, but I would say that most people in the industry are not doing it themselves, meaning they have a third-party consultant like a corporate sustainability strategies that helps them. It's not that they do nothing. Um, it just takes a lot uh, and they usually are outsourcing. Now, I think what you're maybe asking about is on the surveys and maybe Stephanie, did you wanna, I, I saw you pop in here. Maybe not. I didn't know That's, I popped in, but I'm happy to. You did. Oh. <laughs> it so says you would Stephanie, like to answer that Stephanie question. Stephanie Anderson would like to answer. So that's what popped in underneath. At least it shows up on my screen. Yeah. <laughs> Great. I raised my hand and didn't even know it. 
Yeah, I mean, I would definitely agree with you, Brenna. I, I think it's definitely outsourced. I think the companies that you're seeing it that are doing it internally or have departments internally are much, much larger organizations uh, that are able to come equipped with, with that type of staffing to handle it. So I would agree. Yeah. And then if you're thinking about tenants, if you're thinking about, um, you know, how many uh, tenants that could get covered in this process, I think the way to think about it is that, um, let's say you're in multifamily, so you have apartment complexes, one or more, um, you know, those surveys, you could have 200, 500, you know, thousands. Um, and I think as it relates to purely to engagement, Kingsley can, you know, the Grace Hill team through their Kingsley surveys can really help you tailor it to make sure you're addressing all of those and do it quarterly, annually, whatever works for your budget. And that having it outsource again, I think is a value proposition, not just for Grez, but it's also an industry best practice to get that benchmark data. Um, in fact, I had a quick question, if you don't mind, Amy, like yeah. you talked about this scale, but I think it's important people to understand, you know, this rating of three on the elevators in New York versus Ohio. But can you just quickly talk about the scale for Kingsley? It's one to five and, yep. and what yep. that means. Well, we do one to five because uh, we found in, in our history as we've been doing this for over 30 years. So we actually used to do pen, paper, put it in the envelope, mail it out, get it back and, and manually load it and everything. So it's a lot better now. But if, uh, we found that like one to 10 people just don't want to answer. It's too many. So the one to five scale uh, is all you're going to get with indexing. So a three would be considered average, of course. So an average elevator in New York City Okay, I could see that because New York doesn't have the best doesn't have the best elevators. But you know, in the Midwest where you don't have the, the skyscrapers necessarily, a three would be bad. Um, I mean, is that kind of what you were leading for for the indexing or? Yeah, I just yeah, yeah you 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 nailed it. I just think people um, need to understand that you know you're looking for an average score, and three is generally not in anything is not what you want. Right. I do think it means different things in different places. You're right, but uh, when we talk about overall satisfaction, what we're seeing, you know, just based on my own, you know, 30 years of real estate and now as a consultant, they want a four or better, and they yeah. want to exceed the uh, Kingsley benchmark, which, as you described, is kind of what your collective. Uh, participants are scoring on these questions and it's generally better than a four. It's just helpful for people to understand the value of that. Where does that number come from and why? And I yeah. think that's the value of, of using, um, you know, the Grace Hill platform for, for King, Kingsley is to really get that, those additional insights and benchmarking perspectives. Yeah. Well, thank you. Great. We think we're the best too. <laughs> um, I think Lulu had one more question come in. Um, she's saying thank you for answering her question and says, even with the outsourcing, it's taking our internal team a lot of time to help gather the data. So it's great to hear what time frames and headcounts that work for um, just generally. So I think she's just saying thanks and, and sharing her experience. So thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that feedback, yeah. um, Lulu, super helpful. I mean, you are not alone in this regard. And this is partly why I think you know, Grace Hill wanted to have this webinar is to kind of talk about this a little bit more. So you get some insights on, you know, what is GRES? What does it mean? What are ways to help support a GRES submittal? Um, but the, the time and um, uh, effort involved is significant. That's why I say most companies, even bigger companies, but most use a third party, you know, support resource to help facilitate it. Um, just because it you just can blow up, you know, six, eight months of the year for teams is very hard. That being said, um, I do think the more you're benchmarking your data and tracking things throughout the year, it should get easier. First year is the hardest, but over time it should get easier. But we know it's a heavy lift. So appreciate that. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so I don't see any more questions and we're only five minutes shy of our hour. So everybody likes to end the class early and get on the playground. So we're going to end this, but um, I just did want to remind you, you will be getting a copy of this presentation. And in that email, we will put uh, some contact information in there. So if you wanted to talk to Brenna or if you wanted to talk to Grace Hill, you'll be able to reach us. So thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed it and enjoy the rest of your week. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great week. Take care. Thanks again, Amy. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.